Well, hello, folks. It's me again, and I'm not green tonight after yesterday's technological problem with the green shaded screen. I don't know what was going on there, but it's cured now. Uh, I've been looking forward to this one. It's a chance to talk about aviation and talk about pioneering women of aviation. So uh, it's uh, going to be a cracking show. So my guest tonight, Catherine Sharp Landick, is joining me direct from USA. Good evening, Catherine. How are you? Good evening. Thanks for having me. Well, it's uh, a fascinating topic, and um, we'll we'll start at the beginning, really. For those who are unsure what we're talking about, the WASP program, um, what was it all about? I mean, there were a couple of key people that were involved in the creation of it, Jacqueline Cochran, Nancy Harkness Love, and also some males along the way mm -hmm. who, were, who were keen on the idea. To sort of start us off, run us through some of the key individuals who were behind this program, kind of when they got behind it, and really what its purpose was. Right, right. Well, thanks for asking. And, you know, just some of the basic story, you know, the United States, while, while you know, the rest of Europe was entangled in the war, the United States was not and uh, had a big push of not being involved. Uh, but there were those who saw the need for it. And so you have people like Jacqueline Cochran, who was a really famous worldwide uh, uh, aviation uh pilot and and test pilot and things like that yep there's jackie um and she was just very um very active and very much saw the need uh for the united states to get involved and hoped that women could get involved as well uh, others nancy harkness love as you mentioned was another one who was prominent pilot was a test pilot um and really wanted to uh that's a great picture of nancy as well uh, really wanted to uh, see an opportunity for women to serve, uh, particularly as ferry pilots. Her husband worked with the ferry command in the United States as well. So you've got these two women that are have connections. You know, Jackie won awards and sat at lunch with Hap, General Hap, you know, Henry Hap Arnold, and um, so they have these connections. Are able to talk to these men, people like Robert Olds, who is a prominent general in the United States, and talk to them about, hey, we need to use women. You know, they could see what was going on in England with the ATA. Um, and, you know, we need to start getting prepared. So from the very beginning, even before the United States was involved in the war itself, as early as 1939, uh, both Jackie and Nancy are, are pushing for this and advocating for it. And then it's not until September of 1942, they're re really able to push it forward and make it happen in reality, because the United States was so behind. We had, we had, we needed pilots on, on both, um, you know, both theaters of war. And uh, we were building all these planes that had to be, sh you know, flown to the points of embarkation. And uh, so the powers that be, General Arnold and others decided, let's give women a chance uh, and started to let women fly for the Army Air Forces. But it's also true that in 41, 42, to foresee the fact that it wasn't just a matter of fitting women in because it was the right thing to do. It's we, we actually needed people to do these jobs. That was quite forward thinking because it's only now we look back and realize how many women the Russians put into war and how many people in Britain, you know, the land army and the women on the, the work in the trains and the undergrounds and the ordnance factories and, and all what's happening around the world. But that's with hindsight. In 41, 42, when the world war hadn't kind of reached that peak so to speak it mm -hmm. was quite visionary to realize it's not a question of finding a role for the for the pr we need the we need to share mm -hmm. the burden we need to get to get women into jobs that otherwise could be done by men so you know it's 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 a it's a really important thing so what were the steps i mean it's a you've you've got to create a force that is not quite military it's completely new um, as you say the usa isn't even in the war yet there's a, a huge amount of hoops to jump before this this force is actually in the air, uh, pun mm -hmm. intended. So, what what <laughs> what were the steps that they went through in the early period to go from here's an idea of having women ferry pilots to now let's actually have a system with women pilots? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question and a, a great point that that you know the decision was made in the fall of '42 to let them let let women fly and. It, and they saw it as an experiment, but it was, you're exactly right. It was because they desperately needed more pilots. They, they didn't have enough pilots and it takes time. You know, it's one thing to teach someone to rivet or to shoot a gun, um, but to teach someone to fly, you know, it takes a good six months, you know, to get the amount of time before you send them overseas. Uh, so there's a lag there. 
um, in, in getting those pilots. And so this idea of there were there were different philosophies, right? Let's let's bring the women right in. Um, you know, by 42, we were in the war. Uh, let's bring women right in as service pilots, which we did with men pilots um, who maybe weren't going to go and be, um, you know, combat pilots, but but were old enough and good enough uh, to to be these service pilots. And that was Nancy Love's idea. You know, let's let's bring them in as ferry pilots, as these service pilots. Let's integrate them fully into the Army Air Forces that way. Uh, Jackie Cochran had a little bit different philosophy. This idea of let's let's bring women in as a separate unit, right? Let's keep them segregated. Let's protect them uh, to a certain extent uh, and train them separate from the men. So there's you know no hanky panky. Uh, and uh, let's make sure that they they have the opportunity to fly. And her idea was train the women and put them into the ferry command, but then see what else they can do. And so that's that's what ends up happening is they get this much broader role in the, in the work that they do. But but in the beginning, it was this real competition of which path are we going to take? Are we going to have you know 50 women who are flying with the ferry command, and that's it? Uh, or are we going to have Jackie Packman's idea of no? Let's let's take thousands of women and train them to fly and and spread them out all across the air forces. Uh, and and uh, so it was it was a question of detail and a question of philosophy of what they were going to do and what would be best for the country. Yeah, and I think also just to backpedal a little bit um, for people watching today who we talk about the global superstars of the pop world and what have you. We've got to go back to that pre -air war era of mm -hmm. the aviation pioneers like Amelia Earhart, because they were absolutely huge. Weren't they? I mean, mm -hmm. they, they were global, weren't they? And, and yeah. this idea of women being able to go in the air, it, the world war, world war two didn't start that it continued that idea. So I think the, the people, you know, who, who, who pushed for the wasp, they owe their debt to the people before. And I guess Jacqueline is part of that earlier era. Mm -hmm. She's the bridge, I suppose, in terms of age between the kind of the pioneering when women had to do it on their own because there was no support and mm -hmm. the kind of the modern way we're doing it within a, a system. So, you know, paying respect to them is important. But so how does the word get out to to they want recruits and what kind of women came forward and what kind of lives did they come from? Because it's it's really quite a thing to go off and become a flyer, isn't it? So, mm -hmm. so tell us about some of the people that were the, because someone has to be first though. That's the thing it's, right. it's easy to be the 500th person to kind of volunteer, but it's like <laughs> everything else, the Tuskegee Airmen or the commandos or the paratroops, mm -hmm. someone's got to go, yeah, that's a good idea. And I'll be the first. So tell us about right. some of the key early people who, who embraced this idea and where they came from. Right. I, I think that's a great question. And, uh, it kind of builds off of your earlier comment about the 1930s, you know, that golden age of aviation. And of course, Jackie Cochran was a contemporary and friend of Amelia Earhart. This is, you know, you've got Amy Johnson in, in the UK and, um, you know, that that whole era of, of women flyers. Uh, and the women who end up joining the, the WASP are either you know, older women, you know, in their early thirties who were a part of that, you know, Teresa James is one of kind of the, the leads, you know, this is a story of 1800 women, but I don't, the whole book isn't about all 1800. It, I, there's a focus on a few of them. Um, and Teresa James was one of those who, you know, she flew in air shows and she was a stunt pilot and flew the air mail uh, and, and different things like that. And was a flight instructor in the thirties had kind of come up with that. Um, but then you have a lot of other women, and I would say most of the women who become WASP, they really kind of came of age in the glow of the, that golden age of aviation. They, they grew up watching Amelia Earhart and Jackie Cochran and um, knew of them. And I think your point of, of how big of a deal aviation was in the 30s is so essential to understanding 25,000 women applied to be a part of this program. I mean, just literally 25,000 women. I had always thought Jackie Cochran made it up because Jackie Cochran kind of makes things up <laughs> about, about her life. And, and uh, I went, our national archives are in Washington, DC. And I went and I found the box 
that has the letters of application and you know some on onion skin paper mm. and um, women writing and saying, you know, I've always wanted to fly. How do I become a part of this program? Or I'm a flight instructor. I've got 200 hours or, or whatever, but, but you have all sorts of women who apply. You have women who were, you know, farmer's wives in Iowa to, uh, you know, we had Zigfield Follies girls. That was a big dance, uh, you know, in New York city. And uh, we have photographers and teachers and high school students and just a, a whole array of women who, who loved airplanes and saw this as a chance to really be a part of it. Um, so it's just the, the diversity of the women who wanted to be a part of this program. Um, you know, we don't have racial diversity in, in the program, uh, but, but uh, so many, you know, literally tens of thousands of women wanted to be a part of it. I mean, I might touch on the racial side of things later on in my question. I thought you might. Um, yeah. You know, going fight one battle at a time, isn't it? I suppose, mm. but it's in, I was picking up on you said about Jackie being kind of a bit of a, a show off in her writing because I had this exact same thing when I had Claire Mully on talking about Hannah Reich and her women mm -hmm. who flew for Hitler. There's something maybe a connection between the the spirit of being in the air and also being a little bit of a showman, a little bit of a, mm -hmm. a show off, and you can have to sort of wade through the the, the PR mm -hmm. to actually find the truth below it. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. We get the same in, in, in with, with the paratroop commanders, a certain yeah. amount of puffing of chests, and 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 mm -hmm. they're that kind of people who are drawn to that kind of world. But so the women they you know you say 25,000 applicants and it ends up being 1800 people go through the program or enter the program but you know um what what were they did they they obviously were overwhelmed with more more places that, than they were expected to how did it start off what resources were given to them you know where, where did it all happen i mean there's obviously some key airfields and locations and sites that become the part of it but you know as i said earlier you're starting something from scratch there isn't a previous mm -hmm. model to work on you've got to start the model yourself. So, so what, again, you know, the, 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 what are the locations? How did it, how did it go from a force of nothing to a force? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, that's a good question. And that's where you have these kind of parallel um, activities. Uh, you know, there's one women's program, but there are two parts. So Nancy Love starts right away uh, up in Wilmington, Delaware um, with the fairing command. And there are 28 women that come and what had happened is both Nancy and Jackie had done research in the CAA records, right? Our civil aviation uh, records to find the women pilots, women who had flight experience, who had those pilots licenses. So it was literally going in and looking at files and making a list of names and then sending telegrams to those women who had, you know, for, for Nancy's group had over 200 hours of flight time and we're within a certain, you know, between 21 and 35, sending them a long telegram and saying, hey, this is what we're doing. If you're interested, show up at your own expense and we'll interview you and, um, you know, give you a flight test. And if you're good enough, you can stay. And when they started, you know, as you said, they started from scratch. Nobody knew what was going to happen. They were technically civilians working for the, uh, the Army Air Forces. So they had to find them barracks to stay in. You know, the barracks they initially were going to put them in were set up for men and didn't have proper bathroom facilities and all of these things. So just those logistical realities um, were a challenge. And then Jackie's portion of the program was the training of the women. And she starts in Houston, Texas. Uh, the training command was in Fort Worth, Texas. So it made sense to come to Texas. Um, and she started in Houston because it had a big international airport and it had some facilities, but the weather is not conducive to flight training in Houston. And the facilities were horrible and they were staying in motels and um, they soon switched out to Sweetwater, Texas, which is uh, west of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So kind of west central Texas, it's uh, relatively flat, it's wide open spaces. And there was already a base there called Avenger Field, which actually had British cadets there training um, when the women first arrived. They finished the men up and it becomes this um, all women's airfield where it's all women trainees 
uh, learning to, to fly there. So most of the women who went through the training went through the training in Sweetwater. Um, and they patterned the training after the men cadets, what the, what the men and the Army Air Forces were doing. They had the same coursework. You know, they took math, they took Morse code, they took engines and weather and all those same things. Uh, and then they'd spend half their day in the ground school and then the other half of their day um, in, in the flight training. But in the beginning, Jackie had a terrible time getting airplanes for them. They're flying all sorts of different civilian planes. And, and it was just, they, they didn't have wings uh, for them when they graduated. It was just, uh, uh, as you said, it was, it was from the ground up. So it was, it was a bit of a mess, uh, but, but it worked out where it was, it was pretty military by the end. Yeah. And, and I think also when I, you know, you mentioned the training, I want to get this idea across as well of you get the similar thing with the Tuskegee Airmen of the fact it's not about matching the standards of the men. It's kind of improving on because mm -hmm. we've talked about people like Hap Arnold who were behind the program and Eleanor Roosevelt famously was. But there are others who are sitting their arms folded metaphorically waiting for it to fail, waiting mm -hmm. to jump on the problems, waiting to jump. Oh, they're women. They're going to be taking days off. They're going to be doing this. So they, they Jackie and the other women, they decide very early on that they must not just measure up, but measure beyond in that in that way that feminism in the 60s and 70s you have to go beyond you can't just reach the same level you have to go beyond so how did they do that how how would that how would that work practically you've got to show people that the cynic the cynics that not only are we doing it we're doing it better so explain some of the techniques they did mm -hmm. to kind of show how good they were and how good the training was yeah, I, I think that's a good point. And, and that they were definitely aware that they could fail at any time. And that's partly why they weren't brought into the military proper in the beginning. You know, the intention was always to make them a part of the Army Air Forces officially. But the idea was, if it's a civilian program that fails, it can just be shoved aside. Whereas if, you know, it's formally military, it, it'll be more difficult to get rid of without a lot of bad publicity. Um, so one of the biggest things they did is they had very high admission standards. They were very restrictive in who they admitted. Um, Jackie, for her training program, you know, had high, high, you know, the women all had to have some flight training before they came in. But they also had to have things like, you know, they had to have the high school degree. 80% of the women had some college at a time that only 4% of American women had college. Uh, you know, so they were very well educated. Uh, and they had to, um, you know, meet, you know, very stringent uh, health standards, fitness standards. Uh, they also had to have letters of recommendation from people in their community, which, of course, the men didn't. They were being drafted mm -hmm. right and left. Uh, and, and they had to have a personal interview with either Jacqueline Cochran or a member of her staff to make sure that they were polite enough and pretty enough and all of those things, I would argue feminine enough as well. Um, so it was, you know, just in the admissions themselves, they were very selective and very careful. Uh, and then as they went through the training, they had high standards, they had to meet or exceed the same standards that the male cadets were going through. Uh, and Jackie was pretty ruthless on behavior. Uh, this idea of, you know, there's absolutely no drinking, there's absolutely no sex or anything like that. Um, but, but if you just didn't behave right, or didn't have a good enough attitude, they would kick you out. Uh, because it was it was a very cultured image of who these women were, and that they were, they were going out into the world, you know, representing all women pilots. And in Jackie's case, they were going out in the world representing her. Uh, mm -hmm. And she just really was very adamant that they would do their hair, you know, at the, you know, style shop and they would, you know, be very neat and, and things like that beyond just the military, uh, but just the, the social aspects of it. So it was very, um, it was very strict in that way. They also, you know, met the military standards and that they had check pilots from army check pilots, you know, the, the army air forces had Czech pilots there on the field. So they were definitely meeting or exceeding the same standards in the training. 
I mean, I'm touching on the point you said about the being pretty and feminine because my, my other half Mag is watching and she just commented on YouTube and yes, Mag it is kind of a, a, one of the requirements and, you know, mm -hmm. my prep for this, you know, I was saying before we went live, I mean, you just search wasp and the staggering amount of images come up and they are, there's a, there's a glamour element to them that mm -hmm. you can tell there's teams of photographers are gone there and there's, you know, it's not like the male pilots in the eighth air where they've got their caps on and crusher caps. They've always got the hair. There's, there's the one of them, the pilot with the putting the makeup on reflecting in the mm -hmm. fuselage of the aircraft. And you, and you wonder now with the benefit of 2021, looking back at it, it there's some of it's a bit contrived and, 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 and it's mm -hmm. what exactly what they're fighting for. And the equality is being kind of misrepresented and positively represented at the same time. There's a paradox about it, isn't there? Especially mm -hmm. as someone like yourself in education now, you know, a, a doctor, you're looking back. It's it's both pushing things forward, but within still a very misogynistic world. It's mm -hmm. it's a, it is I say paradox is the word that comes to mind. I'll put some images up while we're talking, but yeah. and they're great images, but they are there's a there's an iffiness about them when you look at them now aren't there mm -hmm. so how you know, just as, as i wasn't on my list of questions but when you're That's doing right. your book which is wonderful by the way folks just make get the links you. in the low in the in the description below uk and usa bookshops get just get it don't don't argue with me just go and get it but <laughs> um it you know when you're looking at these images did, did, did you kind of did, did he repel slightly at them when you look at them now it's it's so funny because I I knew many of these women right I had the great fortune of you know starting me down this path I met one of them in 1993 and and so I was friends with many of them, and got to talk to them about these these kinds of images so you know this type of image is is an official Army Air Forces photo and they you know they're they're presenting these women in a very specific way and you mentioned the one with the lipstick and. Um, you know, I talked to uh, one of the women in one of the lipstick photos uh, and she thought it was, you know, so silly and they were kind of embarrassed when they were doing it. But, but um, you know, there's a, there's a couple things going on here. One, the Army Air Forces has like a long-term goal, right? I love that image. Uh, that's mm -hmm. Dora uh, Dougherty on the top there, who's kind of one of my leads in the book. And you can see how worn out the planes are. You know, the, that's a whole nother story. But, but uh, yeah, they're 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 attractive women, and they're presented that way. One, the Army Air Forces wants to be an independent air force at the end of the war, right? That's a, a goal. That's something they wanted before the war, and they were talked into waiting. Uh, you know, hold hold on, let's get through this, and then we'll talk about it. So they, the Army Air Forces itself, was very aware of their image. And they wanted their image to be very, very precise and very specific. They were, uh, you know, all these types of very fun pictures, V for victory, right? That these women are out there doing their part uh, for, the, for the war effort. But there's also a whole um, issue in the United States of, uh, you know, serving in the military is seen as a very masculine thing. And women who served in the military you were um, often, you know, seen by some people in the public as either, you know, wanting to be a man or, or uh, being a lesbian yourself or, you know, just flawed. Why would you want to go and serve in the military? What's the matter with you? Um, and Jackie Cochran was very aware of that image and wanted to defeat that and not not be associated with that image at all. And so that's part of why she's so adamant about her girls are going to be feminine. They're going to wear their lipstick. They're going, you know, in the pictures and, and things like that um, because she didn't want them to get caught up. Our Women's Army Corps had a huge uh, public conflict about, about this. Um, and and uh, so it was. It was very conscious. I will add too that Jackie Cochran ran a cosmetics company, right? You know, she she had a major cosmetics company that she had started herself from the ground up in the middle of the depression. Uh, so, uh, you know, she doesn't talk about it, but I'm quite certain that you know, part of her demand that her girls looked so pretty uh, was because they were associating themselves with her and her cosmetics company. So it's all connected, but, but yeah, you want the women to appear non-threatening, uh, you know, and you've got to connect them to the war effort, but in a non-threatening way. Um, and, mm -hmm. and you're asking them to do this, you know, 
military flying is one of the most masculine, you know, the heroic pilot kind of thing. And, um, and you're going to let in the verbiage of the day, you're going to let a bunch of girls fly these big airplanes. You can't do that and have them go out there and be, you know, just as macho as the guys they've got to do it in their own feminine way. So they're not threatening. Um, Mm. the women knew it was happening. They were very aware of it. Uh, but they also understood the reasons for it. Um, and, and, uh, it was the times as well. Right. They, some women, you know, some of them didn't get to go into restaurants when they were with their, you know, their fellow ferry pilots because they had slacks on, you know, I mean, this is the, this is the era, uh, as well, but, but yeah, that image of them, uh, being pretty enough, um, it was, was part of the, part of the story. But then, you know, you're saying yourself that they're intelligent women, they've had their college educations, they're they're not, Mm -hmm. they're they're bright to be there. They're going to be very savvy of themselves about how they're being, they're being used, but they're also using the system themselves. It's a, it's a two way Mm -hmm. street, isn't it? They're getting to fly, they're getting to do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And yes, they are kind of pawns in a bigger game. And I think that's what appealed to me about your book is that on the surface it's about women who learned who were trained to fly aircraft but that story is kind of over in a minute it's actually it's actually the people it's the nuance Mm -hmm. about how this sort of social experiment is being conducted in the middle of a war and how everybody's got a share in it and everybody's interested in it and some want it to succeed some want it to fail Uh, and it, it that's it's that level of of complexity that i think appealed to me about it is that it is very comical so but let's get back to the I'm so boring. pleased that you got that complexity. That just, well, thank you. I that mean, just I, pleases I, me very much. <laughs> it's, but let's get back to the, the actual roles. So, you know, they're, yeah. they're, when they when they it's at its kind of peak. What were the primary jobs of the WASP? Where were they operating? In which parts of the world were they operating? What were they doing? And give us an idea, of kind of the, the 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 flight times and how hard they're working. Just kind of run it down a bit for the viewers. Yeah, yeah. The actual work that they did, I think, is really important and. Again, my my book's a big story, right? It takes them from the 30s all the way through, you know, the the 70s and the the 2000s. But but um, the work that they did was was really important uh, to the war effort, not just in the United States, but the global war effort. Um, the first group of women are ferry pilots, and a, about a third of the women total, uh, you know, you end up with 1,102 that are actually wearing their wings, um, and about 300 of them are going to be ferry pilots. And these are women that are going to the factories where you know they're building P-51s or or P-38s or whatever, and they're flying them from the factories to the points of embarkation. So they're doing these big, you know, cross-country flights, you know, navigating by the seat of their pants, solo flights, um, uh, you know, usually not in a group, but but solo. You know, okay, this P-51 came off the line. Okay, I'm going to climb in it and I'm going to fly it to the east coast. Um, and so that was that was a really important part of the work that they did. Uh, other women, you know, that then the experience once some women had proved they could do that, uh, then it's like, well, let's put them into these other jobs because there's a lot of domestic flying jobs that had to be done. Uh, so you have you have some women who are flight instructors, you know, instrument flight instructors for men. Uh, the picture you showed earlier with the three women in the plane was of women who were at Camp Davis uh, Army Airfield in North Carolina, and they were tow target pilots. And you can see, again, this plane is is pretty worn out, right? These are war weary planes. You know, the the men who are fighting in combat are going to get the best, but you've got to train men who are going to go overseas and fight. You've got to train them to shoot down an airplane, right? It's a very different thing than shooting a duck. <laughs> You know, mm. they move faster. They, you know, they're not as predictable. Uh, Ducks so, don't shoot back either. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Not usually anyway. That's what I've heard. Uh, so, you know, one, this idea of towing targets uh, is they would have a guy in the back that would tow a sleeve, a target sleeve out the back of the plane. And the pilot would fly a specific route down the beach uh, where the men would fire their, their weapons at them. And, um, Live ammunition, of course, usually color coded, so you could see, you know, which man hit where. Um, it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't exotic or exciting, though it could get exciting. 
but it was a job that needed to be done. So that was the first place they expanded was, okay, well, women can, can fly back and forth and do this and we'll take a male pilot and set, send them to do something else. Um, but then very quickly they expanded into other things. You know, they were flying, non-flying personnel from place to place. There was one wasp I knew who um, her job was to fly the army chaplain to about six different bases every Sunday. She said she didn't go to church for 10 years after the war because she got all her services in uh, in that year and a half she flew. Um, but they, they test flew planes. They did um, the test flying of planes that had been damaged or, or had just routine maintenance. They'd be the ones that would take them off and, and test fly them. Uh, they did experimental work with um, things like uh, the remote controlled aircraft. Uh, they were doing some of that top secret work. Uh, so they just did um, all all sorts of things uh, that just Jacqueline Cochran called it aerial dishwashing, right? It was mm. it was all the work that needed to be done that nobody really wanted to do, right? You don't get any glory for towing a target or you know flying the the chaplain around, uh, but it had to be done. And and uh, she said, you know, let the women do the aerial dishwashing so the men can go and and do more important things. Uh, so. They, they got to do a lot, a lot of stuff. And the standard of flying must have been very good because, you know, the, the pilots I know, but British, American, Canadian, whatever, you can have a career in the Royal Air Force and only ever fly two types of aircraft. You know, you might have been mm -hmm. a hurricane zone in the war, Spitfires, or the, the Spitfire models improved during the war. But in the Wasp, I mean, you, you, could, you could be firing 10 different aircraft in a month. Mm -hmm. um, and as you say, you know, solo missions and, and across. So so they would readily some of them, you know, their, their flight logbooks must have listed a whole variety because they're starting on the obsolete aircraft no one else wants. Mm -hmm. Then they're delivering the brand new ones. So, I mean, I'm sure some of the people, the women you spoke to must have flown 20, 30 different aircraft in the world. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And especially those ferry pilots, um, you know, Teresa James was a ferry pilot and and. Uh, yeah, she, you know, she'd fly a P-38 to one place and then, uh, hey, we got a P-51 that's got to go. It's like, well, I've never flown a P-51. Well, here's the specs, you know, here's the speeds. Why don't you go take it off and land a few times? And then there you go, fly to California or fly to Florida. Um, so it was uh, this this huge variety of, of planes that they flew. Um, and again, especially those ferry pilots, they never knew what they were going to get next. Mm. I just shared that image that you sent me just before the show because I, I oh, like yeah. that one of the allied cooperation there, Brit, Brits and Americans together. Yeah, I love this one. So that's Jackie Cochran in the center, but um, I guess fourth from left is Pauline Gower, uh, who led the ATA, um, and third from left is Helen Ritchie, who is a well-known American pilot. Uh, Jackie Cochran took a group of American women to England uh, to fly with the ATA just before the WASP started. And then actually a few of the women, Helen Ritchie included, uh, when their contract was up with the ATA, came back to the United States and flew um, with the WASP. So there's a, definitely a direct connection there for sure. And I'm just checking what's coming on YouTube as there's some interesting questions there. So Scott Grimwood sure. is asking, did they also do government acceptance flights, the official check flight before an aircraft is transferred to the Army or, Na uh, the Army or Navy or Air Force? Yeah, they did. Um, you know, they were the the first one that took it, so they would be the one that would say yes, this this plane is good or not, uh, or has these problems, these squawks, that kind of thing. Uh, so they, yeah, they they flew Army Air Forces planes, though they didn't fly Navy planes. Mm. Um, you know, so many of them were the same. same uh, you know, model. Yeah, yeah, same, same 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 aircraft, but but uh, they technically just flew the for the Army Air Forces. And the other question I got from Marks and Sparks is um, about Jackie's um, transfer or, or time with the ATA in Britain. You know, was there something the British were doing differently that she took back or did she give something to the British? Because, you know, they're developing these things separately in separate mm -hmm. continents. But of course, you know, the, the, the shared experience of how to do things, does she, mm -hmm. did she reference that time and, and, and how it changed things? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's actually partly why she went, um, you know, she uh, had wanted to start this program earlier, you know, in 1940, 1941, for sure. Um, and the need just wasn't there. Um, you know, you've got to remember the 
Army Air Forces at the time, the, the military in general, felt they had to justify women being a part of it, you know, letting letting women join. Um, and they said, you know, we're not ready yet. But um, General Arnn said, hey, Jackie, why don't you go to England? and check it out. So she had gone over and met pa Pauline Gower and, and saw the operation and what was going on and then came back um, and uh, gathered a group of women to go. And the idea was very precisely go and be a part of the ATA and take the American women to help our ally, but also to understand the operation and what's going on there and what's working and what's not working. And, and then bring that knowledge back and, and help shape the American program. So it was definitely um, definitely an influence uh, on the shaping of the American program. Great answer. So uh, to bring back what we said earlier about, and you mentioned it and I said I'd mention it later, is about the there, there were no African-American pilots, WASP. There was a couple of Chinese. And so what was what's the kind of rationale and reasoning behind that? Um, because there were obviously were applicants from, mm -hmm. so, so just explain that, uh, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is something that the, you know, again, I knew so many of these wasps and they were very aware of it and, um, you know, wanted to, wanted it to be talked about that, that, uh, you know, first the army air forces were or the American military was segregated at the time, especially the army air forces. And that's why we have the Tuskegee airmen because they weren't integrated into the um, greater force. Uh, and so that's, that's one piece of it. This was such an odd program in that you have women who are kind of these separate kind of odd duck um, uh, pilots to begin with. And, you know, the hope of so many of these black women who applied to the program and and i've found the names and applications of at least six i know i believe there were more but but at least six i know their names um and they were qualified many of them had gone through the we had a civilian pilot training program just before the war you know some forward thinking people saw that we were going to need pilots and knew that it was going to happen created this program called it a new deal you know, program to support the aviation industry, but but you have a lot of black pilots that went through that program as well, and um, women were admitted on one to ten. You know, uh, and they applied; they were qualified. Uh, one in particular, Mildred Carter, had a college degree. You know, was just completely um, ready to go. And Jackie argued it was it was you know kind of a bridge too far. I guess she wouldn't have used that term, but we know what that means, right? That that uh, this idea that it, it was hard enough to get women allowed to do it, uh, to have a desegregated unit would have just been too much. Um, mm. Now, could she have pushed it? She was pushing other limits. Could she have pushed it? Uh, maybe. Uh, the ferry command did not have any black pilots, men or women, uh, because there was so much segregation in American society at the time where, you know, there were hotels that wouldn't allow African-Americans to stay. There were restaurants that wouldn't allow African-Americans to come. So the fairing division itself, um, and, and I would love to be corrected if there are examples, but I haven't been able to find any um, of, uh, you know, black ferry pilots uh, just because of the problems that, you know, you land in a small town, you stay where they have for you. Um, so that part of the program wouldn't have been able to take black women either. And Jackie argued that too many of the bases were in the South and too, you know, it was in Sweetwater and it just would have been too hard uh, because there would have been too few to the greater whole. They couldn't segregate them. Uh, so it's, it's one of those disappointing aspects of it, I think, for everyone that, that you've already got this innovative program that's it's pushing the envelope uh, of, of what women pilots can do. And they just, they didn't take that extra step. As you said, there were two Chinese American uh, pilots in the organization. Hazel Ayang Lee was in one of the earliest classes, had a lot of experience flying. Maggie G, who I got to know was in one of the uh, last, second to last class. Uh, and the United States was allied with China. And that was part of the argument was uh, they were allied with China. Uh, we had a few Native American women as well. Um, but but that's about it for, for diversity um, in, in the organization. 
Yeah, I think, you know, it's, I think the bridge too far, you can only do so much at one time. And, you know, what? It, it, it would be wrong of us to kind of judge it harshly. You know, they do so much, but it, it is just interesting. But the thing, all good things come to an end. And so the WASP program does start to kind of reach to its sort of saturation point. So explain how having got this force up and they're doing all these jobs, it does kind of tail off at a certain point. So so how did it all end? And and, and beyond that, what happened to the, the, the people that have been doing this? Because, mm-hmm. you know, they, they've been given so much and then suddenly it's all taken away from them. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's that's a good point. So the um... You know, the end of the WASP is is one of those points where it, it was a great disappointment, obviously, to, to those who were involved. It was a great waste, in, in my view, of, of those who were already in the program. From the very beginning, the point had been to bring the women into the Army Air Forces, right? Okay, let's have a little 90-day uh, uh, time. This, is a, this picture's from Camp Davis, North Carolina. I love this one as well. Um, so, you know, let's, let's uh, you know, give them a 90 day probation and then bring them in, uh, which is what they did with male service pilots that were c- civilians. They'd bring them in for a 90 day um, probation and then make them second lieutenants. That was the plan to do with the women. Uh, then it was a, well, maybe we should bring them in separately and keep them segregated, you know, as women pilots. Uh, and so, okay, well, let's have a bill and go through Congress. And then that session ended and then let's go through Congress again. And by the time, you know, they figure it all out, how they're going to do it. It's, it's early 1944 and, you know, the P-51 has extended fuel tanks. And that's such a weird thing <laughs> to blame the end of the WASP on. Uh, but because of those extended fuel tanks, they're protecting the American bombers going in and uh, the allied bombers going in and uh, fewer pilots are dying, which is good. Everybody agrees. Um, but that means if you're not losing as many pilots, that means you don't need to train as many pilots. So you have this whole group of civilian men pilots who had been in draft deferred positions uh, uh as flight instructors, those early flight instructors for all these new male pilots that the United States was trying to develop. Well, in early 1944, the Army Air Forces says, we don't need you anymore, you're all let go, which meant they were all eligible for the draft, right? Um, So you've got this group of male pilots who is now looking around saying, wait a minute, you've got all these women flying these planes. Why can't we fly those planes? We don't need to go and be in the ground army when you want to invade Japan next fall. We, we, you know, we want to, we want to do this job. So you've got this pressure of publicity, right? These very vocal male pilots who are going to push against these women and push against this bill and a lot of very nasty editorials and things like that. And using those photographs as saying, oh, these are just glamour girls who are just playing at war. And, you know, they, they, you know, they're just like girls in high school who, you know, the pretty girls in high school don't have to do anything to get their A and except bat their eyes kind of thing. And so all that, that work to make the women look non-threatening was used against them. So, so you've got that pressure. And then you've got the pressure that the bill to make the women an official part of the Army Air Forces comes up in June of 1944, which of course, Paul, you know better mm-hmm. than anybody, uh, the, the reality of what that means. And so once the, the allies are effectively on the ground in France and not pushed back into the sea, it's like, well, maybe we really will be able to push forward and maybe we would need even fewer pilots. Uh, and Congress is just not willing to fund these women and their training anymore. And then by fall of 1944, um, they decide, you know what, let's, we've got enough men pilots coming back. We, women can release men for other duty, but they can't replace them. And that was the argument by the fall of 44, that the women were replacing the men instead of releasing them. It's, it's, uh, you know, I argue it's the same as the women who went into the factories and we're, we're doing all the work in the factories. When enough men were surviving and coming back from the war, the women were kicked out because so the men could have the jobs. 
And that was, that was a big part of it. Cause these women were trained, they, they, you know, we'd spend all this money and all this training and they were in there doing a good job, but you know, you can't let the men sit around and feel bad because they're not doing the flying. So, yeah, there's a, there's a sort of sad irony there, isn't there? There's a couple of things I take away from that bit you were saying. You get the same thing like Andrew Higgins factory down in New Orleans is the men came back, mm -hmm. weren't as good a workers as the women and got paid twice as much. So, so mm -hmm. it was lose, lose right. everywhere. But and, and I think the press angle is 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 interesting because I was going to ask about the press, because, again, in my research, just the stonking amounts of in, uh, images there are mm -hmm. out there. And it reminds me of that thing of when someone earns fame. The press is behind you, but when they decide they're turning against on you, suddenly everything they've done to build you up, they flip it. And I got that takeaway from your book that mm -hmm. all these photos, as you said, you know, all these photos now that have built them up now are the very thing, the very evidence to bring them back down mm -hmm. again. There's a sort of weird irony there that, that it was they'd courted, in a sense, the press. Mm -hmm. And now the press sort of, in a sense, betrayed them. But, you know, your point about replacing and uh, the pilots there the wasp program was great when it was it was needed but now mm -hmm. it gets to the point where it's a kind of a um a bonus i can see from a horrible male point of view where actually yeah let's 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 let it go now so mm -hmm. so what happened you know, it's it's disbanded and and it, it, what happened to all these incredible trained pilots i mean yeah yeah i mean you've got these women who have all this experience all this training many of them went home, they, they let them go in December of 1944, which of course, you know, all in the newspapers, the Battle of the Bulge and, you know, all these fantasies of the war would be over by Christmas have been crushed. And these women are coming home and having to explain to their families and their friends and their, you know, that they're no longer needed. Well, how can you no longer be needed? The war is, what's going on in the war? You must not have been doing that much anyway. Uh, so a lot of them were embarrassed and uh, angry <laughs> uh, and sad. Some of them, you know, got married and had families right away. But, but you know, a lot of them wanted to continue serving, continue using their skills. As the war ended, they, you know, they, they, you know, as the war was finishing, they were finding jobs in air traffic control towers and, and things like that. But when the war ended, they all lost their jobs and, and, uh, they couldn't get they because they were never officially made military they didn't get medical benefits they didn't get um the gi bill which helped pay for the education and and all sorts of loans they didn't get the veterans preference when it came to jobs so you know they didn't get any of those perks that they could have had if they'd just been made a part of the military not that those are perks but you know what i mean mm. um and and um uh, but they just picked themselves up and moved on. Many of them continued to fly, uh, but flying is very expensive. So unless they were able to make a living, none of the airlines would take the women pilots on. Um, you know, the airline industry, when the war ended, grew by a, a great deal, but they had all these male pilots they could take. So they didn't, they didn't take the women, though they were often uh, offered stewardess jobs which all but a few turned down, yeah. right? <laughs> um, so, so a lot of, you know, the wealthier of them continued to fly. Um, the, the rest of them, you know, found other jobs as teachers or, or whatever and had families and, and moved on. They worked more and um, uh, stayed more active than their, you know, cohort uh, of women at their, their age level. But um, that was it. They were done mm -hmm. flying. A the only them, bonus is that is that out of adversity is is a spirit because mm -hmm. clearly with your books and the other books that have been written there was a there was a strong bond between these women mm -hmm. so reunions and associations and they felt a togetherness i mean some you know, there's some units infantry units for example that go through such horrors of the hergen forest or something that just don't mm -hmm. have reunions because it was so awful they all went back and just disappeared yeah. these guys had the women guys use the word that's guys. okay they had this bond that mm -hmm. therefore now they have not wanted. Well, out of that is forged this, well, well, we've got each other, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. as an author researching it, at least you've, you know, I'm sure you let each pilot you found led you to three more, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh, you should speak to, you should speak to her and then you should mm -hmm. speak to her. And then you say pre Google days, how do you track down all these people? But it, it, we're, we're coming to, it's been fly, flown past the, the time tonight, but I want to bring you round to the, um, 
a question I particularly wanted to ask about. There's an absolute raft of books about on the wasp, on the individuals, on the program, uh, and some of them have been around for sort of forty years. These books and yours is more recent. Is that a hindrance having all that information out there, or is it an advantage? Because, mm-hmm. that, but then that, I'll ask, let you answer in a minute. But we now know that a lot of those sort of press articles at the time in 42, 43 are kind of contrived. They're part of this media thing. So the information in it is not necessarily what was actually happening. It was what they wanted the public to receive. So, so my first question, you know, is it a hindrance or an advantage having all that information mm-hmm. out there before? Right. Well, I think that's a good question. And um, the reality is when I started, you know, I started in the 1990s and there just wasn't that much out there. There are a few really good books. Uh, Sally, uh, Sally Keel uh, was a niece of one of the Wasp and she wrote a very good book in the late 70s. Um, and that was that was a godsend. I loved that book. And then some of the Wasps themselves wrote books, uh, but there just wasn't much out there. Um you know, that, that told the whole story, a lot of its memoirs, uh, which are helpful, uh, but, you know, they're all flawed in their own ways. Um, the great advantage I had, I think, was there's so many primary sources uh, to work on. And um, I think the biggest difficulty was knowing when to stop. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've worked on, on the Wasp story for over 20 years and uh, 25 years, I guess. But I, I went straight to the source. I, I did oral histories with them and got questionnaires from them. And, you know, I knew, you know, Nancy and Jackie had already died when I started this, but, but uh, I knew Teresa James and I knew Dora Dougherty and I knew Marty, Wild, you know, my kind of leads in the book, I knew them all. And I, you know, I would send them an email or a phone call and say, Hey, what am I, what about this? And, um, so I think that was a real advantage. Um, you know, the WASP archives are at Texas Women's University where I'm a professor, um, which, you know, what historian gets to walk across campus and delve into the documents. Uh, so I think the WASP did have this idea of wanting to be remembered, uh, not just for themselves, but for the 38 who died. Uh, so that's been a huge help. Uh, the secondary work that's out there, I've, I've got them all. I've got every one of them on my shelf right over there. You can't see them, but I see them all. And, and uh, you know, there's little pieces that you t- can take from each one of them, you know, the different stories that they tell. And um, in the beginning, there were a lot of that, that had little sources and those clues, right? As a historian, you're always looking for those clues to that, you know, you're asking a different question and, and the clues are in the work behind before you. So I'm grateful for the, the work that's, that's, you know, went before and, and the memoirs, I think are so important. Um, you know, I, I didn't get to put a bibliography in this book because it was going to be so long. That they, they Second were volume. Worried. Yeah. I mean, that's they the thing worried you know, about the page people count. I know who are writing books about units and they're doing it kind of now. And mm-hmm. there's like three guys left in an entire U S division or bit, you know, you had a lot of people to speak to. Yeah, which is is both lots of work, but it also means if 10 people respond about a particular thing and nine say it was one way and Mm -hmm. one says something different, you kind of dismiss that one and go, yeah, I'm going to go with the nine. You've got that because all histories and testimonies Mm -hmm. are so fraught with memory deviations Mm -hmm. and and, but with that amount, you can just you can just Mm -hmm. the the rule of averages, aren't you? Because, okay, well, they all remember this, that must be it, you know, so Mm -hmm. you can. But yeah, you know, here they, they, we said before we go live. What what are the what are the things in all these little articles? And there's yeah, you, know, you can even even this year I found three articles on Wasp this year. So just wow. in 2021, just coming up. What are the oft repeated myths that when you read them you go, oh god, here we go again. There must be those certain things mm-hmm. that just aren't true that get repeated all the time. Right. Um, one is that they flew to England, which they did not. <laughs> they stayed within the continental United States. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's the quickest myth that I bust is they did not, they did not fly to Europe. Uh, that was a different, they didn't. Um, and then uh, one of the biggest things is that um, tow target, uh, people say that they were shot down doing that. And that's, that's not accurate. Um, there was at that base in Camp Davis, there were two wasps who were killed um, in separate accidents. 
uh, they were tragic. But the the first one, people people who weren't there talk about, and even Wasp did say she was shot down, and it was so awful, and and she was trapped in the plane, and and um, I this is one of the advantages of interviewing people. I was able to interview three people who were there that day, um, one on the ground and two, uh, two on the ground and one in the air and find out what exactly happened on that day. And she was not shot down. It was a train. It was a flight training, uh, uh, with her, you know, instructor and the motor was bad and they crashed and it was awful. Um, but I think that's, that's one of the biggest ones that bothers me so much is because this is a real person that people are perpetuating a myth about. And, and some of the wasp actually had the myth um, in their own minds. Uh, but but mm. that was the advantage of starting early is I got to go right to the source. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and again, Marks and Sparks, his, his last question on YouTube was that uh, about this story of a deliberate sabotage of a bomber that killed a wasp pilot, that there was supposedly sugar in the tank. What's your... Yeah. Yeah, the sugar in the tank uh, bothers me as well. You know, I've spent 25 years looking for any evidence of sugar in a tank. And um, and it was at a particular base. It was actually at Camp Davis uh, that that story comes out. And I can't find any record of that ever being talked about until the early 1970s. Jackie Cochran says it flippantly in an oral history. Um, and I talked very specifically to the women who were at that base when that crash happened and they say nobody even suspected it these planes were worn out they were being cannibalized by the mechanics who were not very good and you know that it was it was a mechanical error it was not sabotage now i'm open if i find evidence of that i will change my tune but i literally i've spent 25 years trying to find evidence of that um, and have found none and the reality is that base that they were on had thousands of pilots. And so to be able to sabotage the exact plane that a wasp was going to fly, it, logistically, it would have been very difficult to do. Even Occam's razor, I think, to. disproves that one, doesn't it, in that in that sense. But um, so we'll, we'll wind things up. And my final question is going to be, it may, it may not be an easy one to answer, but <laughs> the best things of the wasp program and the worst things with the benefit of, 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 of the, of the hindsight and 25 years of study, when you look back now, best things, worst things. I think, um, I think the best things of the whole program is they, they did it, you know, and they proved that women could be reliable pilots and they, they were good, you know, all their records show that they were just as good as the men and some jobs, they were better. Uh, and they proved that, you know, the cockpit doesn't care you know, about the gender of, of the pilot. I think um, the worst thing is that these women were forgotten for so long that everything that was learned from their program, and they kept all sorts of records of what they could do, what they couldn't do, how to train them, all these things. It was all just lost, you know, and some people say it was, it was you know, concealed, but it wasn't, it was forgotten, which I think is worse. And, and that we've got to start over and, um, you know, that, that, you know, women at the, you know, women in the Air Force today, people are just now figuring out how they should wear their hair so they can wear a helmet over it. I mean, are you kidding? <laughs> you know? um, so I think, I think that's the thing that frustrates me the most is how forgotten they were and how the lessons that, that we could have all learned from them. You know, why weren't women flying in the 50s, 60s? You know, why, why was there a break? Um, it just doesn't make any sense. And women today are still only 7% of all pilots. And, um, I, I don't understand that myself, but, but I, so yeah. I, the deaths of the 38 were worse, obviously, but, yeah. but big picture wise. I mean, you can, you can take that with a lot of things in World War II is that the, the heights of equality and technology mm -hmm. we reached then, everything went backwards for a while before it had mm -hmm. to reach up that same, you know, the, the racial um, integration is another mm -hmm. example. The, yeah. uh, the, the, the ability for people in Britain, I mean, my, you know, my lasting grievance, and it wasn't that it was anyone's fault, we were completely flat on our asses with no money, is there was no GI Bill equivalent in Britain. Right. You know, my family who served, it was back to, if you're lucky, you get a job. 
Uh, mm-hmm. We had a Labour government that bought us the health service, but we didn't have the the the, the money to spend. Right. So so all that all what we'd fought for, we didn't achieve. I mean, that's mm-hmm. that's there's a, there's a lot of things about that. I mean, I, I guess you're not speaking German today, so I guess we. Well, that's it. That. Yeah, I mean, I'm not grumbling. <laughs> you know, it's all it's all it's all uh, it's all good. But you know, you see these advances yeah. being made, mm-hmm. and the, and the the momentum they've got behind it gets lost and then yeah. has to, and someone else has to pick up the mantle someone's mm-hmm. three decades later and start all the work again to mm-hmm. get back to exactly the same place they'd already reached it's 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 okay. it's ironic sometimes but anyway i have really enjoyed this conversation Catherine. it's been, I, I, i've learned a lot I, I enjoyed the book people enjoying it lots of side conversations going on oh good it, thank you it is something that needs to be talked about more and um so um i i know you've 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 been you're busy teaching and 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 the what but is there another story from world war ii you'd like to work on in the future are you working on something oh, else future the- work um i'll tell you i i uh i'm starting to you know i'm recovering from 25 years on a project and and thinking of not being able to keep working on it um there's lots of little side stories that i want to work on but i'm i'm thinking about um women flight nurses in in world war ii especially in europe uh, there was one in particular who was held as a POW by the Germans, an American, um, and and just the experience of those flight nurses who flew in the back of the planes, you know, they there was uh, some that flew in the gliders that landed at the Remagen Bridge and such, and it's like, what? <laughs> you know? Yeah, no. Uh, I- Jean Tierney comes to mind. I think that's her name. I met her many times um, and her husband and they met in Normandy and she's like four foot nine. I mean, she's taller than that, but she's like tiny yeah. and built like a kind of a canary. It's tiny. I mean, I know I saw her when she was elderly. Yeah. But her husband, yeah, she was throwing men on the back of C-47, taking them back to me and you're going, really? I'm, su- I'm surprised she can pick up her purse. You know, this right. is a tiny little... And you hear what they were doing in the war. And this is, this is yeah. on uh, D plus one off Omaha Beach. There, There's an airfield up there and she's coming mm-hmm. in and see if Evans and taking wounded men on and you'd ask her how did you get them on the back of the air car we just picked them up you know there was it's just right. fine right. you know that's a great a great story there to do um uh, yeah. if any if i could help anything to please let me well, know Well, i might but, have to give you a call about that one that's good i think they're still alive those two i'm not sure i haven't heard from, I'll, I'll check that out but I, that's the one i can think of but in anyway it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you for those watching um at least i wasn't green tonight that was good tomorrow we've got two shows tomorrow both with a canadian theme we've got uh ellen besner coming on talking about canada's jews and what's great about that show weather permitting i have two cameras out the two cemeteries in normandy and we're going to go by these various graves and ellen's going to tell the stories of these brave young men who died in normandy and there's we're going to lay stones on their graves that's going to be wonderful that's tomorrow afternoon and then in the evening we're talking about logistics with arthur coming on canadian captain in the army coming on talking about the supply of the canadian army and how they got tanks to the front and how that all works so two shows and tim cook on sunday talking about the fight for canada's history all about his amazing book about canada and how it lost and forgot and remembered again then forgot again its history over 75 years so lots coming up don't forget the links below to buying catherine's book to catherine's website to my website uh patreon youtube um spread the word and get out there and get and um share what we're doing here and um yeah so catherine thanks very much for joining me it was really really good and um did you enjoy it very much thank you this has been terrific and uh, anything i can do to help great so the viewers have enjoyed it so i'm paul woodhead this is catherine we're going to say good night and i'll see you all again on world war ii tv two two double bill tomorrow thanks Mm -hmm. for watching everyone